Hi everyone, Teddy Baldessar here. And in this video, we're going to be continuing our series of answering some of your questions through a q and A. I I asked a question on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. What are some questions you have for me? Watch related, some not watch related. We're gonna be going through some of those here today. Also, if you wanna stay in the loop for future Q and A's and wanna ask a question, be sure to follow us on all those different platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, we're active and posting great content in all those places. And then we do ask the question for you to submit some questions. Uh, it's the best place to do it. We'll link to all of those down below in the description. Now, before we jump in, some cool new releases available on teddybaldister.com you should check out. First, the Tiso Sidreal release coming very soon. Sign up to get notified about this one. It's a great piece for summer. Three colors to choose from, available in 41 millimeters. It's a forged carbon case, 300 meters of water resistance, condensed lug to lug of 46.5 millimeters. Makes this one wear like a 39 millimeters given the lack of traditional lugs. Perhaps the most attainable carbon case Swiss watch on the market under $1,000 retail. Then we have the Junghans Max Bill Bauhaus Chronoscope. The Chronoscope is the chronograph version of the popular Max Bill collection, a wristwatch that was adapted from a kitchen wall clock of the mid 20th century from a designer of the same name. Max Bill was a student of the prestigious Bauhaus School of Design, with this watch paying tribute by way of its red accents in an ornate case back showcasing the building of the German School of Design. And finally, the 38 millimeter Seiko 5 Sports Models, sometimes also known as the 5KX models, available in a variety of different colors, filling some of, but not the entire void of the SKX-013. So check them all out on teddybaldasar.com. Links will be in the description down below. So our first question comes from Twitter. So I've heard some of your colleagues say that Tudor will pass Omega as a brand in a few years. This being part of Rolex's strategy, what do you think? So when referring to colleagues, I believe you're probably just referring to different people online talking about this subject. Would I agree with that? No, and I'll share my points why. First, let's discuss Tudor. I'm a huge fan of Tudor, own several of their watches. I'm a champion of Tudor. I love what they're doing but they've almost in the past decade redefined what the brand represents. This was a brand that started back in 1926 and it was just a trademark at that point. 1946 was really when they started to produce watches and at that point, it really was just some rehashing of Rolex design language with no true icon to call their own outside of maybe the Tudor Submariner, which of course we know where that inspiration comes from. And looking at the business side of things, this also furthers this point. Looking at Omega versus Tudor in that Morgan Stanley Lux Consult report, did a full deep dive on this on the channel earlier uh, this year. I'll link to that down in the description, but Omega's total Swiss turnover was 2.47 billion in 2022. Tudor, on the other hand, was 570 million. Certainly have grown in the last decade, but that is only one fourth of the size of Omega. So I don't see this happening anytime soon. We also have to just look at what Omega is bringing forward in terms of a product level. Now, Tudor, let's give them their kudos. The master chronometer that they're starting to work on on a couple of different references, as well as the product offering that they've been able to develop, the Pelagos, phenomenal watch. And I do think that Omega doesn't almost have anything that directly matches up perfectly with that titanium dive watch the same way that Tudor has perfected it with the Pelagos. That mid-sized diver of the 58 also is a pretty unique offering. I think allows them to carve out a different type of lane that Omega hasn't fully capitalized on in the same way. But apart from that, I think if you go down the board of what Omega is delivering from a product by product basis, you see that Omega almost has an answer for every other Tudor product and much more. Also, when you're factoring in things like the Speedmaster being an absolute icon, what they've done for chronometry, you're talking about the coaxial escapement, mass producing those Meta certification watches on a large scale. But then you also have that Spirate system, which I am very intrigued by, and I'm interested to see what Omega is going to do with this going forward, how many different models are going to roll this out to, but this is a revolutionary development when you're talking about fine tune and regulation on a wider scale of watchmaking. And giving you that zero to plus two range of deviation, this is class leading. In addition, you're getting a better finish movement with Omega compared to Tudor. Some people don't necessarily care about this as much, but that is certainly a point they have to mention. And then I'll just call attention to something like the Chrono Chime, which is out there. It's more of an eclectic offering. It's not going to be something that is going to be a commercialized product by way of sell-through. And does it make sense for Tudor to do anything similar to that? No, but the fact that Omega is doing it and can do it, I think does deserve some kudos. For the enthusiast crowd, I do think Tudor has done a remarkable job and they are growing and gaining ground on Omega in terms of just 
the centralized watch enthusiast, but if you're looking at a global scale, Omega is a huge brand and an important brand in many different markets. I know for most of us enthusiasts, we think about Speedmaster, Seamaster, but for them on a global scale, they're pretty equaled out in terms of their four pillars. Constellation and DeVille are huge in different parts of the globe and even sell better in certain parts of the globe than some of these other sports references, which is crazy to think about outside of the watch enthusiast crowd, but it is the truth. Is Tudor gaining ground? Absolutely. But are they on the same level, both from a sell-through side as well as a brand prestige side as Omega? I don't think so. Next question comes from Twitter. Why are quartz watches looked down by people instead of automatic versions? So this is somewhat of a complex type of idea. Yes, there's still some snobbery associated with quartz watches, but I think it's a more involved concept than that. For one, why do people like mechanical watches? I think you have to look at that concept first. For many, it's this romantic idea. We have these mechanical objects that are self-sufficient. They don't need an external power supply. They're assembled by hand in many instances, finished by hand, and embody in many cases the antithesis of what products in our modern world represent, which are basically disposable, chargeable objects. Mechanical watches appeal to a totally different wavelength. Quartz watches have a different appeal. It's more for that technical pursuit of accuracy, it's more mass produced, it's going to, of course, lean into the kind of set it and forget it type of nature and convenience factor that will come with a quartz watch, but it doesn't have the same romantic factor that I think so many people love when they are looking at a mechanical watch. So I think that's step one. Another factor is just going to be that quartz watches are much more easy to mass produce than mechanical watches, so that rarity factor of mechanical watches is going to offer up maybe some additional intrigue. Specifically looking at the Swiss watch industry, and I know this is a smaller fraction of the whole of global watchmaking, but in 2010, there were approximately 26.1 million Swiss watches produced. Of that number, 21.2 were quartz watches, so that's 81%. And even today, 62% of Swiss watches are going to be quartz. So the majority are still quartz watches, and if you look at the global playing field, Japanese watches, watches made in China, and beyond, you have a vast majority that are going to be quartz. And I would say the final thing has to be just what quartz watches did to the mechanical watch industry. Now this is not my personal opinion or what I think about quartz watches, but there are many people out there in the Swiss industry specifically that, you know, just lost their jobs. Their culture was completely shaken up by course timekeeping. So there's going to be people that are going to have resentment. But I think ultimately it comes down to mostly this idea of what a course watch represents to enthusiasts versus maybe what a mechanical watch represents. One's a bit more romantic. The quartz watch in every instance is going to be more practical, but that's not why people like watches. I think that's ultimately why most people, when they look at a quartz watch, maybe don't have the same level of intrigue. I don't think it's all snobbery. There are certainly people that are out there that are going to have a snobbish take on quartz watches. But if we're trying to unpack why people have this opinion, I think it's a bit more involved. I think these are some of the reasons. Next question comes from Instagram, simply asking, why Cleveland? So as some of you know, I live in Cleveland, Ohio. I was born and raised here. I've been fortunate enough to travel, I've been to like 20 countries, been to many states in the United States, I would say the majority of them. And I understand where Cleveland sits in the global hierarchy of things, but I do think in general, now Cleveland's in a state called Ohio for people that are not from the US, uh, which is kind of in an area known as the Midwest, which is not on the coast, it's more center of the country. But I'll say this, I think Cleveland and Ohio in general is very much overlooked and underestimated. I love living in Cleveland. I think it has a lot more to offer than most people will think. The arts in this town are fantastic. Top 10 art museum in the country, Cleveland Orchestra, top 10 in the world, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You also have Playhouse Square, one of the largest performing art centers in the world and one of the largest in the United States. I think it's actually just second behind New York. Also in Cleveland, you have one of the best hospital systems in the world with the Cleveland Clinic. We have three professional sports teams, which I'm a big fan of, of course, we do not have a lot of winning happening at times. We did win a championship in 2016, but uh, you know that's where I get my resilience, all this losing over the years. In addition, food scene is pretty solid, uh, melting pots of a lot of different culture, great cost of living. You can live like a king here compared to what I'd be doing in New York, which I really prefer to do that. Uh, it's centrally located in the United States, easy to get on a flight and go to many different places, not too far of a flight. On a fresh body of water, it's an amazing place to be in the summertime. And ultimately it's, it's home. I mean, I grew up here, I, I love it here. I've been able to see a lot 
lot of different places, but uh, there's some charm to this place that even if I'm trying to think about it in the most unbiased standpoint, uh, I think it has a lot to offer and I enjoy living here. And nowadays in 2023, I mean, you can kind of just do your work anywhere as long as it doesn't interrupt and especially what I do, which is more digital. So that's why I'm here. Next question comes from Instagram. Do you think Rolex's official pre-owned program will slow down the gray market inflated prices? Quick answer, no. And the reason why is because I don't think that's Rolex's intention at all. I actually have a video on this subject when they first announced it. I had some speculation and I think a lot of the speculation that I had is turning out to be pretty true. What Rolex wants is they want to be able to stabilize the market. Think about as a brand, especially a luxury brand, your price integrity and being able to maintain a price point is so crucial. But now with Rolex, the retail price is not a way to dictate what the trading value of a watch is, just given the current market dynamics of the brand. So if that's the case and people that are outside of your domain are controlling that price, that's a dangerous thing for a luxury brand. You saw what happened at the end of last year with the prices going down for Rolex on the secondary market. Rolex comes out of nowhere, says, hey, we're gonna start doing some certified pre-owned product. To me, it made perfect sense. I thought it was a brilliant move. What they're doing is they're trying to stabilize, or at least this is my opinion, they might have a different thought process around this, but this allows them to have a point of stabilization within the pricing of their watches beyond just the retail price. By seeing that Rolex CPO price, you always are going to have a benchmark as a dealer to look at for the trading value. So they're going to try to stay close to that to maximize their profits. As long as that is there for the ceiling, then I think that's going to allow Rolex to have some ability to control or set the market price in the secondary channels. And just to look at an example of this, I pulled up the Explorer 2 16570 on watch charts. Great tool if you wanna you know, kind of see what's going on in the secondary market channels. They do a lot of analysis, uh, current listings, market uh, just dynamics of what's going on and previous sales to develop a market price. Right now they have that reference at $8,224 in trading value. But based on looking around uh, in some different CPO programs, I saw this one on Booker that has, you know, just box and papers, of course, authenticated and everything from Rolex, Swiss made stamp, uh, Super Luminova 2003 example for 11,500. So I think this kind of goes to show a little bit of a premium here in what they're offering up, which, you know, to be expected, but that's really what I would imagine Rolex is trying to do here. I don't think they would volunteer to make their prices go down. I don't know why any brand would do that in their defense. Uh, so I think this is really what's going on here. Another question from Instagram, Jared asks, why does the US not have an iconic homemade watch company? Switzerland, Germany, and Japan all have multiple. We don't have a single one. So there's a couple things I'll just say here. Now, there are some boutique brands out there in the US, but you're right. Comparatively speaking, if you look at other countries, we're nowhere close. Back in the 1800s, this was not the case though. The US was a powerhouse when it came to manufacturing watches. Brands like Waltham, Elgin, Hamilton. In the early 20th century too, you saw a lot of this happening. And I remember going to Longines and visiting their manufacturer and their museum. They talked about Ernest Francillian, who was the nephew of the founder of Longines in the late 1800s, coming over to the United States because he was just baffled about how the US was able to mass produce watches at the scale that they were doing it at the time. I think this was a byproduct of a variety of things for the US. Number one was just the fact that once the quartz crisis came on, there was some hardship facing the mechanical watch industry. At that time, it didn't make much sense and the incentive was not there for our economy like other economies in the world to really lean into it. And we didn't have those pillars at the time uh, because mechanical watchmaking in the US was gradually going down at the point in which it started to really face some turmoil in the 1970s and 80s. But I think the main reason why the US also has not seen much of a large scale manufacturer of watches is just going to be, we don't have the infrastructure and we've also developed a different language around what it means to be made in the US compared to places like Switzerland and Germany, for example. It's much more strict here. The FTC determined what it means to have that made in the USA stamp. If you look at Swiss watches, that's such a prestigious classification, but here in the United States, we've almost made it so difficult that there's less of an incentive to actually develop develop products with that made in the USA stamp. But really what it means to be made in the USA is that all or virtually all, and this was a quote from the FTC themselves, all or virtually all the product has 
to be made in America. That is all significant parts, processing and labor that go into the product must be of US origin. So very little tolerance for getting parts from different places. And it's interesting how this works. If you look at Switzerland, you can still get that claim of being Swiss made with much less of a barrier, which I think in turn, given how the Swiss industry operates and how much of the Swiss industry is dependent on watchmaking, plus that being the case, it does incentivize more production and innovation in the watchmaking space compared to the US. We also just don't have the infrastructure the same way Switzerland does, Germany does, or Japan does uh, to be able to get third party movements, parts. It's hard to do that with those standards. You can get a made in Germany watch without a German movement on the inside. For the US, that would just not be possible. So it's a very complicated subject. I mean, this is just some of my just own understanding of this and how I interpret it. Uh, but there's a lot involved here, no question. But if you do want some brands that are doing some things on a smaller scale in the US, I'll have a link down below to our article where we go and kind of highlight some of those brands. You might be interested in that. Next question asks, also, we are a second or third LinkedIn connection. Would you be down to connect? And I'm just gonna answer this question for anybody that sees me on LinkedIn. Please send me a message or connect with me. Love to connect on there from more of a business side. Uh, sometimes we post like job listings or things of that sort. So if you wanna stay connected, happy to do it. And it's always great to connect with people on that front as well. So go ahead and add me on LinkedIn. Next question comes from Instagram. Which brands do you think contribute the most to propagating watches among women? I would say the first one that comes up, Cartier. I think Cartier, if you're looking at here in the United States where I'm from, absolutely dominates when it comes to women's watches. This is like the gateway for many women, I think, when it comes to showing some interest. And I think part of that is just the slight deviation over from how well they do jewelry already. And then looking at a watch, I think it's an easy stepping stone for most women that are maybe not that interested in watches. And that could just really start to, you know, give them the bug to maybe want to take another step and look at watchmaking in a totally different light. I also think they do a really good job in offering up products for a wide range of people while not feeling so forced. There's a lot of brands that will do women's watches that just, they just don't feel very authentic in doing it. Another brand you have to mention is Rolex. They do a great job of meeting that mass consumer uh, and getting women in the door, I think, and showing interest in their brand. I think some other brands you have to mention, Longines. I think they make some beautiful watches for women at that like $1,000 to $3,000 price tier. So a wonderful brand to take a look at and I think get people interested. I also think there's brands like Omega that do a great job of just creating a variety of different case sizes, a variety of different styles, and then also having watches that are more just on the nose being catered to uh, a more jewelry focused audience uh, with something like the Constellation in DeVille. One thing that really kind of blew my mind when I heard it for the first time was just how well the DeVille and Constellation is in different parts of Asia. Like the watch to own as a woman in uh, Asia, specifically China, is a Constellation in DeVille. Like those are watches that are so much a part of the culture and um, items that so many people are looking for from that luxury segment, they sell remarkably well. I think Breguet, Patek, of course, do some very interesting things. And just when you're talking about elegance, uh, beautiful watches, have to mention them. But if I had to name like the big four and uh, spiking the interest, I'd say Cartier, Rolex, Omega, and probably Longines. Next question comes from Facebook. Jeff asks, can you overwind an automatic watch? Saw this debate about watch winders and if they are good or bad for a watch in the long run, since they may overwind a watch and wear them out. Let's just address your question in two fronts. First, the question about can you overwind a automatic watch, and then we'll get into the question about winders in general. Automatic watches come with something known as a slipping bridle. I actually have a video talking about this in more detail, but it basically is an extension. It's like a pre-tension extension spring that is connected to the mainspring, which will allow the spring to not coil too tightly and overwind. So when you're dealing with a rotor or oscillating weight on a movement, that can basically wind infinitely. So this is just that layer of protection for the movement so it doesn't overwind. But now let's address the question about are winders you know, problematic? I think most watchmakers would say, are winders needed? Absolutely not. Uh, I think a lot of the sayings that you would see something about like, oh, the lubrication in the watch is gonna be dried out if you don't let it run and you need to have a winder. like. That from most of the watchmaker I've spoken to is just doesn't have much merit. Winder, this is how I look at it. It's a great way to display your watch. It's a also convenience machine. That's really what it is. If you have many different watches, especially complicated watches to set, think of a perpetual calendar, to have to set that all the time, some of those watches just make sense to put on a winder. So that's where I see a winder being useful. If you're worried about extra wear and tear on your movement, now these 
watches are very robust. They're meant to be running all the time. They're constructed to be worn every single day. So are you adding additional wear and tear that is outside of the range of uh, you know, what is possible for these movements? Absolutely not. But you are you know, having the escapement run and there's going to be friction involved. So it really just comes down to you and what you value. So are winders needed? Absolutely not. But are they convenient for a larger collection, especially for watches that are more difficult to set? Absolutely. And just like anything, as you're wearing your watches, it is going to cause wear on the escapement. So, you know, in theory, yes, it does cause uh, wear on the watch itself. So I think you just have to take it that way. But I do think winders are very cool and they do have their place within a collector's journey, depending on what you have in your collection and what you value. Another question here comes from Instagram. What watch are you going to wear to your wedding? So I am one month away from this and I am kind of struggling with what to do exactly still. I know I want to incorporate my great grandfather's watch and I just think that makes a lot of sense, whether it's for the dinner afterwards, uh, reception, small reception, we're doing something very small, or it's for the actual day itself and the actual uh, ceremony. I'm not really sure how that's gonna shake out, but I know I wanna have that watch be a part of that because uh, it's very special. Uh, if you've not seen my video talking about that watch, I will link to it down below. Probably one of my favorite videos I've ever done. And I think it might give you a little sense of where I come from and uh, you know where I get my name from because my real name is actually not Teddy. Spoiler alert. But I'll probably have two watches on the day, one for the ceremony, one for afterwards. Uh, so that will be probably what I do. I know my great grandfather's watch is going to be one of them. I'm just not sure what the other one is going to be and how that's all going to shake loose. I'm probably just gonna make a decision probably a couple of days before. I'm not gonna buy a new watch for this, but uh, you know, we'll see. All right guys, well that is my Q&A for today. If you enjoyed the video and you want us to continue to do this in the future, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell icon, really would appreciate that as well. If you want to be in the loop for future Q&As, be sure to follow us on all our different social media platforms. And also definitely check out teddyballastar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. How we're able to fund all of our productions on this channel is through teddybaldenstar.com and selling watches. We don't have the brands pay us for content. Uh, we are completely self-funded by selling watches. So if you are in the market for a watch, we would love to have your business. We know you can go anywhere, uh, but we really would appreciate it because it allows us to keep doing what we're doing here. And we love what we do. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.